want you to know, for those of you that are just joining us today, is that we are a church unlike any other church. I'm going to say what my late husband said because it resonates with me right now. It has resonated with me, but it resonates more than ever. When you come through these doors, no one is asking you to change. You come through these doors, and you're asking God to change you through his word, through the spirit. There's nobody here that's going to tell you how to clean up before you come into the church. I love the fact that Romans 3.23 says, we are all, we have all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. There isn't one person in this sanctuary, starting with me, yours truly, that can say, I haven't sinned or I have no sin. When you come through these doors, there's only one requirement, that you actually, I'm going to use the B word, because it's a starting point, that you actually believe, that's the precursor to getting up there to fading, that you actually believe that God is able to change you, that God is able to take you just where you're at and change you and begin a work in you that you may not feel, radio people, that was air quotes, but that you will know with certainty. And that certainty only comes from the word going forth. And when that word is brought forth, then you can, you can leave saying, just like the Apostle Paul, henceforth, I let no man trouble me. I let no woman trouble me. I let no one trouble me. I bear in my body the brands, the marks, the stigmata of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Too many people want, wanting to fruit inspect. And I, I use this as a, an opportunity to tell you we, we, are like, we are unlike any other church. Why? Beginning with your pastor, I don't have any baggage. Thank God I don't have any baggage. Thank God that when I met Dr. Scott, the, the few pieces that I held on to so dearly got left outside the door, and I began to realize that I had lived a lie for so many years, thinking that engaging in ceremonial behavior was, was the sign, which is where most people start, outside with the bags, wanting to bring them in. I'm telling you, as first-timers here, as repeat guests, as my friends and family, leave the baggage outside and let Christ begin to cleanse and refresh and renew your mind which only he can do, not somebody coming in and saying, now here's the checklist and here's what we expect you to do. You won't get that from me. And if you get it from anybody else, I want to know about it so I can come deal with them for you. I won't tolerate that. <laughs> As for my brothers and sisters in Northern California sitting at the church, you know, it's a hard thing to be associated with a ministry where the person leading the ministry, which is me, has had every single, I think every possible thing that you could imagine be slung at me has been. Now, I say this for my friends and family sitting up there and listening. Stepping out and identifying with Christ means sometimes you will be unpopular. I'm not looking for people to come in to the church and ask what my opinion is. Everybody in this building has an opinion. We're not interested in opinions. We're interested in what saith the scriptures. Let me start by saying we're told to not judge people. I had to sit down and tell somebody earlier in the week, too many, way too many people coming into the church, calling themselves Christians, and the first thing they do is they are looking to pick at you and to pull you down and to criticize you and condemn you. So I'm telling you as a congregation both here and those that are listening up north and to my brothers and sisters and churches, pastors that tune in for their congregation at this hour, what makes this ministry different is I do believe no matter what happens, Christ says we are to love our enemies. The hardest concept to wrap our minds around, it is that cup of cold water, or sometimes it may be 
what's called the coals, the heaping up of coals. When somebody says, aren't you going to do something against this or say something against this? Well, not unless the law is broken. Break the law and we've got a couple of cops here that will come arrest you. But I'm not looking to try and enforce legalistic ideas of what the church ought to be. I believe just what Paul said, you are to work out your salvation. You and God work it out with phobias and traumas, the Greek word. I'll help you. I'll open up the word. There are things that really I believe God has given me only because of what I have lived through, and I've lived through them through the eyes of the scripture. That makes it valuable. If it's just experience being declared, then it's of no value because my experience and yours may not be the same. But if it's experience that has been lived, tested, and tried through this word, then just like Job, I know when I come through, and I have come through, de-drossified each way as I go, and there's still more that he's got to take out and remove, but that's his job. So take comfort for some of you that are coming in and you say, well... People want, the, it's like a tug of war. People want me to go here, and I want to go to the popular ministry, and I want to go where, and you start building a list, and suddenly I have to ask this question. I'll look in the camera and ask it in your list. Where is your relationship with Christ? May I ask that again? In your list of things you're looking for for a church, where is your relationship to Christ? Let that sink in. Let that truly sink in, because that's the one thing I'm interested in. You building up your relationship in him and he in you. And when that is settled, all these other things that people go questing for will just somehow disappear. They'll become irrelevant to you as they are irrelevant to me. You want some social activities? Go find some great place where you can learn how to line dance. I don't know if people still do that. <laughs> Your pastor's not against dancing. I don't think it's a sin, although there are some people who dance who should not dance because they have no rhythm. <laughs> We've seen that here in this church. We do have it on tape. You find your social activities elsewhere. The church was never designed to be a social outlet. People love to come in and say, well, what, what do, you, do you have any? You're a female pastor. Do you have anything for men? Do you have a woman's retreat? Do you have anything like a singles club? And all of the, I could just, I want you to indulge me for a minute because I bear these things on my heart. They're very, they're important to me. The same people that will ask those questions will be asked by a pastor somewhere in a pulpit if Jesus Christ was here right now. Famous question. What would Jesus do? Well, fool. Christ is already in you, walking with you. He was, in, he was in you and with you. When you went to bed last night, when you were in the bathroom this morning, and in your car with anything you might have said or thought or did, he has been with you. Quit the nonsense. Quit, quit the nonsense of somebody trying to ask you, what would, what would Jesus do at this point? Because we know Christ in you, the hope of glory, already leading you. And for some of you, you're just like me, it's a hard thing to swallow that people will be cruel and people will say and people will do. And I'll only say this to you on this note. Those people that are still looking for the social clubs and all the acceptability factors for a church, I'm going to say this again. If Christ comes at the bottom of your list, you are not looking for a church. You're looking for a social outlet and you should go find it. But if you're looking for a relationship with Christ, you begin his word and you find someone who's opening up the word of God and bringing it to you so that you may grow thereby. You begin with milk and you build up to strong meat. And that is how a child of God becomes a child of God, not by all these other things. share something with you, and I pray I, I, I don't uh, say too much or embarrass, but, you know, we had a communion last Sunday, and I had prepared a whole bunch of things. Just before I began to speak, I really felt like 
I can't even explain it, except that I knew I needed to keep it simple. I had prepared a whole bunch of translation and a lot of good stuff, and I don't know why I was, at the time, I didn't know why I was hindered and felt like I must keep it simple. Now, that should be a rule of thumb in preaching anyway. It should be simple. Everyone should understand it. But this is a congregation that has been well taught. You've seen, my goodness, multiple languages and all kinds of original resources used here. And of course, <clears throat> in true fashion, I have learned to stop fighting God. Because, you know, there's the, I want my way, and I'm going to do my thing, and I can sing, I did it my way. Or I can be obedient to what's going on, and I did not know at the time. But it was only told to me afterwards that one of our very, very faithful, she's a staff member, and her sweet mama that I met, just a dear, lovely lady, um, she took communion for the first time with us. And I was, I was kind of blown away by that because I had also heard that she almost didn't because of bad teaching and people scaring other people about how, you know, you, you shouldn't go or people tell all kinds of weird things. And she, I give credit to the daughter. She's, I've known her for um, many, many years. And in true fashion, she basically told her mama to keep quiet and listen to me. And I'm giving you the nice version. <laughs> It wasn't until after that message was delivered to me that I understood why. There was one person that needed to hear something in a very simple way that would take away the fear of approaching the table. So you can see a little bit how things go with me. I'm very sensitive to that, and I began to pray as always. After the Sunday message happens, whether it's here or wherever we're having service, Immediately after the service, I begin to pray and ask the Lord what I should do for the following week. It starts as early as when I finish here and I'm done with the festival. Immediately it starts. The wheels are turning, the prayer wheels are going, everything is happening. Okay. And I was earnestly praying and asking God, and I began down the pathway of studying, and I was going to present a message on joy because we experienced that together as a congregation. And then it's as if God was saying, no, it's like, you know, going down a great banquet of food and I have my plate is empty and I'm just about to reach to take something on my plate and nope, not that, nope, don't touch that, nope. <laughs> That's pretty much what happened as I was combing the scriptures and really trying to find out what it is as I do every week. And then it became really clear based on two or three factors that happen. One of them that some of you are aware of, which is uh, a brother that was very faithful here for many, many years, got promoted, um, and that contributed to, and then some other things. So I'm giving you this as the background because this message was birthed out of what happened during the week. And at times I think I can preach a message and we can open up the Word of God, but if it doesn't ring home and register, you'll walk away with the sermon idea and not an application. And I'm not looking for ideas, I'm looking for application today. So I ask you please to open your Bibles and we're going to start in the book of Job, in the 19th chapter. That's just for my Hebrew students, so they won't feel like they're, they're left out. Vani yadati goeli chai. That's the Hebrew of Job 19 and 25. But I want to start at verse 23. In the background to this 19th chapter, Job, well, put you this way, he's been through a lot already. Now, you know, if you only read the Bible and you read it as Bible characters, I used to know somebody used to say, these are good Bible stories, and it used to drive me crazy. 
because although they may be quote unquote good Bible stories, they are living words to us to understand how to deal with adversity, how to deal when, when things seem to be coming our way and we think we don't deserve this. In Job's case, he's being, whether right or wrong, it doesn't matter. You'll understand in a minute. He's being accused by his friends. You ever had any of those type of friends? Busy always picking and nitpicking and you know, they're probing at you all the time. I have had people around me like that. They come under the guise of being friends. Most of them come under the guise of being Christian friends. And then they just want to, you know, it's like that one thread that you pull out because it's hanging right there and it's really bothering you and you pull at it and it unravels the whole thing and you're hem, the hem of your pants or your jacket comes down because you thought just pulling this one little thing right here would fix it. I have friends like that. You have friends like that? Yes, ma'am. If they could just, and they only want to gently cut away what's bothering them, if they could, if they were even allowed to, they want to pull on it and make a mess out of you. By the time you're done, you can be reduced down to a pile of wool. They'll be happy. Maybe not. Here's the case with Job. And I've taught a few messages in the opening chapter. I've bounced around a little bit at the latter chapters, but this particular thing stood out. At verse 23, he says, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. We can also add to Job's repertoire a prophet, because they are in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. And this word is forever settled in heaven, another one of those. And then he makes this declaration, for I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And I put that, for I know my Redeemer liveth, that's the Hebrew, ani ve'yadati goli chai. I know that my Redeemer lives, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. I, I'll see it with my own eyes, not somebody else reporting to me. I will see it, though my reins be consumed within me. Now, just kind of stop right there for a second, because if you read on, you see that he is in the middle of being cut to pieces, essentially, by his friends. And with friends like that, who needs enemies? But I want to put flesh and blood on this for many reasons. It's almost like there are probably a dozen messages in here. One of the more important things that jumps out is what to do when you're accused. Whether you're falsely accused or somebody's actually nailing you on something you did. And I, I want to make this clear because this is, a, this is a whole, an accumulation of things that happened during the week that when I finally opened up my Bible and was thumbing through, this passage came back again and again. And the question that many scholars have debated, I know because I've read all the commentaries over the years, they've debated this, whether Job even understood what he was saying. For the Jewish scholars, they don't want to even entertain the fact that when Job says, I know my Redeemer lives, that he was even referencing Christ. They, they don't want to hear about that. And there are some Christian scholars. Albert Barnes was one of them that said, don't go and try and make this about our Savior, when in fact, when you look at it closely, it can be no other. Uh, the language is very interesting, and many of you know who study and have been here. I love languages. The first thing I did was to check it out language-wise. I love what, what's going to happen through these passages. Why? What to do when we are falsely accused. People come and bring accusations, as I said, whether they're false or they're true. And what this declaration, I know that my Redeemer liveth, should mean to us. You know, a lot of people will come into the church, they will read these passages, or they may even hear them spoken, but there, there must be several applications, and they must be real to you, and they must be real to me. Not only what to do when you're falsely accused, but what also to do when you or I are looking at 
we'll, we'll call it the reality, the terminus of life here. You know, it's a wonderful thing to listen to the preachers on TV talk about your prosperity and everything that you can have and you can get. But what I read about in this passage right here is I read about a man who in real crisis and real poverty, remember he had everything taken away from him, has real property. And the real property is nestled in the declaration, I know my Redeemer lives. Now, if somebody came here looking for something in the tangible realm, this is a, this is a tangible message for those people who say, I know my Redeemer lives. What does this mean? Not just a declaration. I remember Dr. Scott used to say uh, at holiday time, at Easter time, people would sing the song, He lives. Ask me now how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. I pray to God I don't have to try and explain today that the reason why I can confidently stand on Job's words as I know my Redeemer lives is not because I feel something or because I instinctively and intuitively know something, but rather the factual basis of the resurrection presented, beginning in the prophecy in the third chapter of Genesis and culminating in what is revealed in the book of Revelation. My Redeemer is risen, not a dead, laying in a grave Savior, not still on the cross Savior, but risen. And because he has risen, all the things that he said about himself, the claims he made about himself, are all validated in that one moment in time when he came out of the grave. So I hope I don't have to debate that today because that's not the intent of my message. If you're wanting to know about the proofs of the resurrection, I hope you will tune in to the network throughout the week and they'll be playing some resurrection teaching that should be the foundation for every Christian. Not God so loved the world, even though that is the most quoted, John 3, 16, but an explanation in a factual, eye-opening reality that the claims that Christ made are indeed true, not because I'd like to feel they are, but because revealed in this book, examining the evidence tells me so. So we're not discussing that right now. We're talking about a statement standing on an already settled fact, but some of you, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That's all great, but Christ was not yet when Job said these words, right? That's all the more amazing. Uh, and, and if we begin to probe this, it becomes very clear that this Hebrew word is an old word. Let's write this in English for you. Goel. So, vani for I, Yadati, know this, we had a little city there, would be my Goel. Martin Luther once said, the marrow of the gospel is in the personal pronouns, and I agree with him. My Goel, my Redeemer, Chai, lives. Now, what's so special about this Hebrew word is it carries with it several meanings. Now, this is where my eyes will light up, because when you start to go down the pathway of this, we can see goel, the word goel, the Hebrew word. We're reading it in our scripture in the King James as redeemer, and there's nothing wrong with the word redeemer. But the Hebrew word is goel. You find the first use of this word, goel, in Genesis 48 and verse 16, when Jacob is talking, and he says, the angel of the Lord that had redeemed him out of all of his trouble. And I'm not sure that you'll have a Bible like mine, because my Bible, it's a very strange Bible, has lots of mistakes in it. But one thing they didn't make a mistake with is in Genesis 48, 16, they capitalized angel. Because evidently, and with clarity, they understood the wrestling match was not simply with any angel or any particular angelic being, but a messenger, if not the Lord himself, so that first word, the first occurrence of that word, as the Hebrew scholars like to do, occurring in Genesis 48 and 16, I believe it is. Someone can confirm that with me. We have Jacob referring to 
the one that delivered him out of all of his trouble. So we have Goel, first use as a deliverer out of trouble. The second time we encounter Goel, Exodus 6.6 6 and Exodus 15 and onward, where God says that he redeemed Israel out of bondage, out of bondage with an outstretched arm. So we have being delivered out of trouble, being delivered out of bondage, and that's the general sense we might say is initially presented. But there's a deeper meaning. Because when we get into the book of Ruth, that small, just four chapters long, which most people tend to read over, is all about the concept of the kinsman redeemer. And probably no greater illustration of what the goel, kinsman redeemer, should mean to us. Here we have the story of a woman who essentially, if you know the story, quite familiar one, of a woman who basically, she comes out of a foreign land, marries, the mother loses her husband, sister loses her husband, she loses her husband. Now it's the mother and the children, and the mother begs and says, listen, you need to go on with your lives and leave me be. I'm going to go back to where I came from, and you go back to your respective land. One of the daughters went, the other one stayed. And this is the story of Naomi and Ruth. And in that day, if you could not produce children, you had no value as a woman. So when we begin to kind of go through this story in Ruth's book, we understand here is this man next of kin. He's the closest in the family line to be able to redeem back Ruth. And what I love about this story is Boaz, who is the main person, the main figure in this small book, he didn't simply just say, let Ruth glean in my field and let her simply eat out of my field, but he took her to wife, to himself, just as Christ desires to, for us to be wed unto him in the spirit of understanding, the kinsman redeemer, so well depicted in that book of Ruth, required that one next of kin, and there was, by the way, there was a closer next, next to, uh, Boaz was slightly further away, there was one more that was a closer relative, and when, when they convened at the gate of the city, the one that was closer, when he found out he had to take the wife, and the mother, <laughs> he said, no thanks, that could harm me. So Boaz then takes Ruth and everything that uh, is established there, and that is the principle, that one next of kin could redeem back and preserve the husband's line. That was the essential, the name of the family and the lineage, and we know that out of this family comes descending down to King David. So in the concept of Goel, we not only have one who delivers out of trouble, one who delivered out of bondage, but the underlying principle of Goel is next of kin, someone who is able to redeem back or buy back. Say, for example, in the day, in the time of the Old Testament, if you owned a property and you could not pay your taxes, you could not support yourself, and now you and your farm and your property are sold into slavery. You are sold. One next of kin, Goel, could buy you back out of bondage. I could go down the list of things, say someone is killed, someone is slain. The same word Goel carries into the English as avenger, to avenge the person's death. Now, what I want to drive home in our passage here is when, when Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, he says, I, I know that my Goel lives. And so I want you to put, put underneath that idea, at the same time, a nearest of kin, at the same time, a deliverer, at the same time, an advocate. And what I love about this is we're referring to God and we know in the New Testament we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one. We have an advocate. He didn't have the knowledge we have, and I'm not sure that he understood the fullness of what he said. 
Maybe he did, we, we'll never know. We'll know over there. But the point of pressing on this is this declaration is made in the middle of him losing everything, being falsely accused, and looking and staring death in the face. And these are things that should be addressed. They should be addressed in a way that if we rightly understand them, we're flesh. We're going to grieve for people that get promoted. We're going to feel the pain of separation. I am a widow. There is not a day that doesn't go by that I don't know that there is a part of me that's not here. And many of you who have had loved ones that have been promoted, in fact, my grief this week was that the brother who was promoted, who I told you about earlier on in, on Sunday, um, he had no next of kin. And this, this is why I said this was birthed out of this. It, it came to me as a moment of clarity. Here is a person who had no next of kin. And then I'll tell you, in trying to act in that position, which we have not yet solved the problem and we're working on it, we also found out that his wife has not yet been laid to rest either. She passed away three weeks earlier. And I was thinking to myself, and I, I, I want to step into that position to be able to put the bodies. It's just, folks, it's just it's the clothes they wore while they were here. That's what the Christian understands clearly, that if we really believe that our Redeemer, our Goel, lives, this is just, this is laid down eventually and hopefully put away, nicely folded in a drawer and put away. And we don't have the same outlook as other people have. The only thing that struck me is that there was no next of kin, and I began to think about this, which is now you can maybe see a connection. I began to think about this, and I thought, well, this is maybe the most beautiful illustration, that here's a person who knew the life of faith, who had absolute, absolute certainty of the life he was living. So in, from his vantage point, and we all know that he, had, he didn't have a whole and perfect body, I kept thinking, well, those are just the clothes he wore here, and those are going to be put away for a new and perfect one. And in that breath, I know the one who is the Redeemer, who, who redeems. And I can only say it for me, and you can only say it for you. That's why that personal pronoun is so important. He's mine. That this, had it not been for my Goel, my Redeemer, first father Adam, let the estate go into bankruptcy and forfeit of what was really ours to begin with. I needed a redeemer. You needed a redeemer. So when you think about this, we can go through life and we can have, we can have kin, we can have friends, and we can have family. But until this, these words right here become a reality, my redeemer, we sing a song, I know my Redeemer lives, and it talks about he lives to take away my sorrow, and he lives for this, but he lives for something vastly more important. And that is the beginning of, of understanding that is, is cloaked in Philippians 2, where it says he took upon him the form of a, ser a servant, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, took upon him this, this form, and then died the death on the cross. And in that moment of incarnation and death, striking out and canceling out and becoming the Redeemer, and you say, well, of course I know this meaning, but dig a little bit deeper into the meaning. Make it something personal to you because you see your friends and your family, just like Job, some that come to accuse, some that come to do whatever they do, and even the people around you the people you hold on to the tightest, whether you depart before they do or you see them off. And I'm talking about death, that final and last sting. Claiming this understanding says, I will not, hear me carefully, I will not die. This is why the scripture uses this. The King James used these words to fall asleep. Because he, he said the believers in Christ shall fall asleep. Why? Because 
They've died the death, but they will be risen with him. Now, I ask you the question, because he took on this role for us voluntarily. No one coerced him. He could have said no. The father could have said, son, I want you to go. No, I don't want to. Well, you have to go, son. You got to go. He did it voluntarily. And in that voluntary state, taking on, leaving the throne of glory and taking on this fallen state, you read, we've just been studying in the book of Hebrews where it says, He that sanctifieth and all they that are sanctified in him, therefore he is not ashamed to call them brethren, family. That's the most poignant thing right here, that Job has lost his children, ten kids in one fell swoop. His house is gone. His wife, well, we don't really know the whole story about the wife except she was interesting. <laughs> and it is this faith that says, I know my Redeemer lives. It's so casual, perhaps, in the English, so that I keep going back to the Goel. Now, let's talk about this in another dimension, because kinsman redeemer is at the underlying portion of this message. But there's something else. I want you to think about this word also being translated sometimes as vindicator, not just redeemer, not just deliverer, as vindicator. I know my vindicator lives. You say, how can I say that? How can I express this like this? And I'll say it like this. I have seen more people under the guise of being Christians come and bring accusations. And I, I wish I would have had this knowledge, friends, nine plus years ago when people were busy just doing everything under the sun at me. I wish I would have had this knowledge and understanding that I have now. Some of you are going to go, wow, I cannot believe you're saying this, but it's, I got good Bible for it. Don't seek to avenge yourself. I wish someone would have had the wisdom to tell me that. Don't seek to avenge yourself. Don't seek to, like I was talking to somebody that said, but you don't know uh, how people treat me because my, my love and my stand for Christ. Don't seek to avenge yourself. Why? Because the scripture says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. What type of vengeance do you think that you can mete out to somebody with your tongue or with your hands that will surpass what God is able to do in a flash. Now, this is a hard pill because nine years ago, I was busy fighting for my life in front of you while people were attacking every part of my being, my marriage, everything was being pulled apart. And I did stand and try to defend. I realize now that the only thing that makes sense to me is people will always come at you with what I call the fiery darts from hell. They'll always come at you. They'll always find a fault with you. They'll find a fault with how you believe, how you worship, how you dress, how you talk, how you look. My goodness, if they could pick apart the air you breathe in your lungs, they would. Don't seek to avenge yourself. I want you to look at Job, and that's why I said, accusations that come will come. And I wrote down a scripture that I thought, you know, seemingly so apropos. Micah says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. A message to all of those people who have ever felt like Job, like the people that are supposed to come around you and be brothers and sisters, they're busy ripping you apart. Well, let me just say one thing to you. Don't seek to avenge yourself. There's a whole universe out there of people who will spend all of their days on the internet, and that's all they do. They hurl, they talk, they chide, they jest, they mock, they threaten. Now, if I really believe, and I'm telling you this because we're all subject to this by degrees, if I really believe that my Redeemer, my Goel, lives, and he is my redeemer, and he bought and paid me. He bought and paid for me. He bought and paid for you. If I really believe that, then my redeemer is also my advocate, and my redeemer is also my vindicator, and in the day when I shall see him, he is well able to vindicate me, not because of the brethren, not because of the accusers. But hear me out. 
there'll be people that will say, well, what if somebody comes against you? And they are certain that you are sinful and guilty. <laughs> Don't defend yourself in a kangaroo court. The worst thing that you can do, I don't read Job. Now, you'll read a lot of things about Job, but in this one declaration, he says a mouthful. Now, my Redeemer lives, my Advocate lives, my Vindicator lives. Now, let me read from 1 John. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You see, many people read this first epistle of John, they get confused. It's very clear right here. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And he goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He forgives us, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So the next time, this may be a hard lesson. It was hard for me. It's taken me almost 10 years to, to understand what this means. But I'm taking a page out of Job for this. Accusations will come. Railings will come. People will do the darndest things. Now you say, well, hmm, look at that. But don't think that the people around you are above doing what Satan and Michael were doing, it says they were wrestling. They were contending for the body of Moses. Moses is already dead. They were fighting over this, the clothing, the, the earth clothes. They were fighting over his body. For good reason, by the way, which is another message. What I'm saying to you is don't put it past people to try and do something and let's just entertain from it and say, like Job, these are false accusations. I'm not guilty. Well, let, let's read on because there's something quite profound here right in 1 John. When he talks about this, he says, of course, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. So let's talk about those who are falsely accused first because that seems to be the, the worst burn. What about Joshua, the high priest who was standing, and Satan came to bring accusation against him? Look at those filthy garments. God said, remove the filthy garments and put on festive ones. You'll always have people coming and trying to put something on. You know, the, the world loves, this is a hard thing I'm going to say, the world loves lying. We are, by the way of nature, we're all children of disobedience, or were, and of the world. That's second nature to us. That's in our DNA. So, of course, it's much easier to hurl something hurtful and deceitful that can make a mess. You who have been washed in the blood, who have been cleansed, who are walking, trying to walk with God, of course. Why wouldn't people who are being used of the devil come and hurl at you to put stains back on you? Isn't that Satan's design? Bring you back to show you you are not cleansed so you can listen to him say, you are not forgiven, you are not cleansed, you are not even bought and redeemed, you're just still a filthy pail of uh, sinning rags, and that's all you are and that's all you'll ever be. False, false accusations will come in many shapes and forms. You know, people that say, well, I'm not truly sure that Pastor Scott saved. You, well... Brother, you, you may be right. Only God knows that, doesn't he? And I'm not too concerned with what you think of me because my main concern and my sole concern is what does the Lord think of me because he bought me. See, that's the big thing for me. He redeemed me. He purchased me. He delivered me. He took me. I now belong to him. So if I am that trash that people say that I am, I'm his trash. What a delightful thing. I, I know you didn't come to church today thinking that your pastor would say that I'm his trash, but you know, if I was in the dumpster of life and you were all in the dumpster of life and he deigned a stoop down and garbage pick to pull you and me out, 
that I'm a happy piece of trash that he even deigned to come get me. <laughs> what about if it's true? Like Job's friends, maybe there was some part of this that was in part true and the accusations were true. Now here comes the brethren, you know. We're going to go and confront so-and-so. No one ever does this biblically, by the way. If you ever you notice that people who come as Christians, they want to come at you and they want to condemn you and they want to catch you in your sin because they don't sin. But they would like to catch you and they won't even read the Bible. The Bible says that if you have issue with somebody, you go to that person one-on-one. -on -one. You talk to that person one-on-one. -on -one. That's what the Bible says. And if that person will not hear you, you take another person with you. And if that person and you combined, two or three, will not be heard or received, then just tell it to the church. Most people don't even tell it to the church. They go right outside. Here's, on, here's the freeway called the Internet, and we'll just, we'll just take up all the space we can. These are people under the guise of being Christians. That's why I said to you, I'm not concerned about what somebody can do to this container. These clothes, it's like, you know, when Dr. Scott died, it took me... Uh, probably five, six years to empty a closet, that big, that big round closet. It was, it was, it was a tough task because there was a lot of clothes in there. Dr. Scott had a lot of clothes. He liked to wear clothes of every size. And <laughs> big clothes and smaller clothes. And there were a couple of items in there. I confess to you, there were a couple of items in there. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't get rid of them. I just could not. I knew that all, most of the things I had to let go of, there were a couple of things I held on to. One of them is that, you remember you used to paint in that big long painting smock? I couldn't bear to let go of that thing because it just, it was like a big snuggly thing. So I kept it. And every once in a while I would open the drawer and see it in the drawer. And it's very strange because over time it only reminded me more and more that these are just, they're just the clothes. That's all they are that we know absent from the body, present with the Lord. So when, when we talk about what someone can do to this, as long as my faith is not undone, as long as I do not detach from the one who bought me, the one who vindicates, the one who is my advocate, the one who is by me, with me, can sympathize, can understand before, before any of your family, and I mean no disrespect, but before any of your family can know to the point of deep gnosis, of deep understanding, what pains you are suffering, mental or physical, Christ already knows, and that's why he is your and my Redeemer, in this, using this Hebrew word, he's connected beyond. And when death does occur, and when the sting of death does happen, you know, we talk about how people understand heaven, death, and dying. Christ says there'll be no giving in marriage. We'll be as the angels are. We'll have new bodies. We'll be as the angels are. So think about it. Christ is not only your kinsman redeemer, your goel in the now. He is your redeemer your goel through eternity. And when you begin to think of that, that's what should shake some of the people who are so busy with all of these auxiliary functions they'd like the church to have rather than building a relationship, knowing God and grabbing hold of the only one who cared enough to save you, who you're supposedly going to spend eternity with. I'd love for the, I don't want to call it a caricature, but I'd love for it to be so. Somebody said to me, how do you envision your loved ones in heaven? Will we see them again? We'll see them again. But we will not know them as we knew them here. We'll not be as we were here. And the only one that we will know, only with greater understanding, because the eyes of the flesh will be changed for the, the fullest eyes of the face when Christ is revealed and we see him, not through a darkened glass and not through some uh, illustrations, but we, we shall see him and we shall be like him. And that is the thing, that when I read this passage from Job, it dawned on me. We have all of this given to us. We have this picture, which is not just a picture, but a reality. False accusations from the brethren, true accusations, and then the accuser of the brethren, he himself who comes. And in all these things, you must remind yourself you must put it in your brain that he bought you. He knows exactly. He knows all about Melissa Scott. He knows about each and every single one of you. 
and he still bought you, and he still loves you. I was sitting with somebody, and I said, you know, here's the mess missing message of the church. The love of Christ is understood and revealed by Paul in the book of Galatians when he says, the spirit is love, joy, peace. And he goes on to tell about what it looks like, what, what the spirit person looks like flowing through us. And he begins with love because this is how Jesus said we will know we are his disciples if we have love for one another. Now, I go back, I take you back to Job. Don't think I've departed too far away because in my mind, when I had read this, I thought about being accused, falsely accused, true accusations, the accuser of the brethren, and then perhaps the greatest of these. Could I get a congregation, which I believe I have, I don't have to get one, I believe I have one, that understands death is not the end, that the concept of being redeemed, why would, why would he redeem us? Why would he buy us back if ultimately it, your, yours and my life ends with in the dust and consumed and there's nothing more? So. It seems rather simple. I have painted this picture, and as I said, I'm not interested in ideas, but application. I think probably the greatest one that I can say is here is a man who had everything taken away from him. And though he was poor in poverty, he was rich in understanding. Now it's time for the church to get back to its original position. It begins with us, it begins here, to not be taken with every wind of doctrine, to not be taken with the self-help group that says, well, you know how to fix that problem. I'm not against going through programs. I'm not against people seeking help, but you understand the first place is, look at this man, has everything taken away from him. He has, his life is in a mess. He's being accused, and he can only say this one thing, I know my Redeemer lives. And that, know, that knowledge, if you will, was not an ambiguous uh, I'm not quite sure, but I, I wish it would be. He doesn't say, I know that my wife and my children live. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And the love of Christ for the church today must be grounded in that. It's like saying people peddle Christianity, and there's never any depth to the peddling. It's just, here it comes. Here comes the altar call. Will you accept Christ today? Will you accept him as your Redeemer today? But the reality is, he redeemed the whole planet, the whole earth, the whole creation. And he didn't stop to say, and, you know, I'm considering redeeming you, but uh, tell me what do you think? What's your opinion on this matter? This is, this is the idiocy of what gets peddled as Christianity. But rather, that's why I said, if you look at this picture, it gives encouragement, and it says something else. Let me read down, because... He says, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, I don't say, wow, this is kind of a gross and grim message. It's not. He says, yet in my flesh shall I see God, for whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold. And I translated that, the eyes have seen perfectly. That means not just I, we shall see him, we shall see him perfectly as he is. Now, that is the greatest statement. When accusations come your way, when people are busy hurling, when, people, when it looks like the whole society is against you, people have turned against you, and you've had everything taken away. I think of the one man who uh, had $3 in his pocket as he came north, but he wanted to be in church. There is riches for you. There is riches. You show me a person who understands what I'm saying about this, and I'll tell you, that's a person that has riches. They're not the riches that can be stolen. They're not the riches that can be traded. These are the riches that are the riches in Christ, eternal. Now, I'm curious to know, how many of you have suffered, and you just kind of, you either keep quiet or you hurl back? How many? Well, you hurl back, because that's, that's more atypical of this congregation. But you've suffered people accusing you and pointing at you and ridiculing you. Show me your hands. That's almost all of you. And I just stood here and said to you, 
Don't defend. Don't try and seek vengeance. Well, aren't you going to do something about what they just said? Well, I've had to sift this over time. And the real matter is going to come down to this. Do I really believe? That's the question for Melissa Scott. Do I really believe that he bought and paid for me? And is my redeemer, my deliverer, my advocate, my vindicate? Do I believe this? Because if I believe this and I'm precious in his sight, then what is precious in his sight? He will defend. He will take care of. He will make sure that justice is meted out. He'll also make sure that along the way, if there are things that I am guilty of, I don't need people to point the finger and say, you're guilty, like some courtroom. Believe me, that's why we have this wonderful gift given to us of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction to our hearts, to bring greater understanding and greater clarity. The more you press into God, the more you seek and desire to know His will, the more you're exposed, that conviction comes. You don't need somebody to come and point the finger and say, aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, oh, sure, yeah, yeah, you, right over there, you. You don't need it. The fact of the matter is you know that you had a sentence of death. I know I had a sentence of death on my life. But for the grace of God. Now, I want you to say this with me as I bring this service to a close because it's not just if we read things so commonly and we can say, well, I know that my Redeemer lives, but he personalizes it with that pronoun. He says, my Redeemer lives. Not I want to believe that he lives, not I want to think he lives, not it's possible that he lives. My Redeemer lives. Will you say it with me? My, My Redeemer, Redeemer lives. lives. He not only lives and loves you, but is going to guide you and be your Redeemer in eternity, greater than any force, any power that you could ever pray or ask for has already been granted unto you. We don't have the ability to understand the riches of our inheritance, but we have in part by the word of God. I pray, I'm praying for the church world. I'm praying for when people hear this message, they'll say, you know, I don't need to be told what God is doing because I have received something that if God did nothing else for me, I know in whom I have believed, in whom I have placed my trust in my life, my soul, my Redeemer lives and loves me here and now and clear on to eternity. That is my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.